and you're trashing your own currency, then we're going to hit you with tariffs. So your choice is going to be join this currency club with modeled on the Plaza Accord, or we're going to slam you hard with tariffs, which Lighthizer did to the Japanese. That's how he saved the U.S. auto industry in the, in the 1980s. Japanese were taking over. They put high tariffs on Japanese cars. So, uh, so this is not a currency war. He's trying to end a currency war. He's trying to achieve stability. Um, and do it cooperatively. But if you don't join the club, you're going to get hit with tariffs. So, so yes, you can see that coming. Say, so who are the winners in that? The winners are people who invest in the United States and workers. Uh, the losers are people who are, you know, betting on China uh, or, um, uh, you know, getting their money out of the United States. Today, we're exploring the insights of Jim Ricketts, a renowned economist and financial expert. With his extensive background, including meetings with senior Treasury officials and high-level engagements at institutions like the Fed and the Pentagon, Rickards offers a unique perspective on currency wars, economic stability, and the evolving role of the US dollar. In this video, we'll break down his analysis and predictions, providing you with a comprehensive understanding of these complex topics. Jim Ricketts begins by discussing his interactions with senior US officials responsible for the dollar's international role. Despite his warnings, he finds that many officials remain convinced that the US dollar will always be the world's reserve currency. This belief, Rickards argues, shows a significant blind spot in their understanding of the changing global financial landscape. Rickards introduces the concept of currency wars, noting that these conflicts have been ongoing since 2010. Contrary to popular belief, he asserts that former President Trump did not initiate these wars, but aimed to end them. The strategy Trump employed was reminiscent of Ronald Reagan and James Baker's approach during the Plaza Accord in 1985 and the Louvre Accord in 1987. These agreements successfully stabilized the dollar through coordinated intervention among major economies, leading to a period of economic stability known as the Great Moderation. Central to Trump's strategy was Robert Lighthizer, the US trade representative. Lighthizer aimed to emulate the success of the Plaza and Louvre Accords by coordinating with other major economies to achieve currency stability. Rickards emphasizes that the goal was not to weaken the dollar arbitrarily, but to manage its value cooperatively. Failure to participate in these agreements would result in tariffs, a tactic that Lighthizer successfully used against Japan in the 1980s to protect the US auto industry. Rickards identifies the potential winners and losers in this evolving scenario. Those investing in the US and American workers stand to benefit, while those betting on countries like China might face challenges. He explains that the BRICS nations Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa now include additional members, making them a formidable economic and political bloc. However, the idea of any single BRICS currency becoming a global reserve currency is unlikely due to the lack of necessary financial infrastructure in these countries. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. I met with senior treasury officials. I've been in the Fed, the White House. I've sat at the Pentagon with you know two, one person away from the senior treasury official with responsibility for uh, the dollar uh, dollar relations in, in Asia. And I told them exactly what I just told you. I mean, uh, you know, in, in different scenarios. And they they don't get it. They bang the table. The U.S. is dollar is the reserve currency. It always will be, et cetera. They're really blind to this. Uh, so I wouldn't count on them being able to, to see through it. But coming back to your other point, uh, yeah, it's a big deal. Now, the, the there's, there's the reality and then there's the story. So what's the storyline from, you know, the right. deep state and the mainstream media and all that? <clears throat> there's pardon me. They're saying um, Trump wants to start the, the currency wars and he wants to weaken the dollar, you know, to promote U.S. exports and export related jobs, et cetera. Um, and uh, so that's that's the kind of we're supposed to worry because Trump's going to destroy the dollar. Um, first of all, it, it's not true. That's not what he's doing. Trump is not trying to start or continue a currency war. He's trying to end the currency war. The currency war has been going on since 2010. That's what my first book was about. Uh, but I also said in that book, that book came out in 2011. I said currency wars we're not always we're not always in one but when we are they can last 15 or 20 years so here we are 2024 i'm not surprised that you know 13 years after the book came out we're still in a currency war because i said that's how long they can last and we are so it's not a new currency war it's, it's been the same one that's been going on for you know as i say 13 years so um but what trump's trying to do is end it his model 
is what Ronald Reagan and James Baker did at the Plaza Accord in 1985 and the Louvre Accord in 1987. So what was going on then? Uh, coming out of the severe recession of 81, 82, 20% interest rates, Paul Volcker, et cetera, we finally got inflation down to about a little over 3% by 1983. Growth was really strong, 16% uh, compound growth between 83 and 86. The dollar hit an all-time high. If you look at the Fed broad trade weighted index, the dollar hit an all-time high in 1985. Baker and Reagan, Baker was Secretary of the Treasury at the time, just said the dollar was too strong, and they didn't want to trash it. What they wanted to do is get together with Japan, Germany, because remember, we're still in the euro, sorry, this is before the euro, so you still had the Deutsche Mark and the French franc and sterling and yen and all that. They met at the Plaza Hotel in New York. Uh, they had a conference with the, foreign, with the uh, finance ministers, and they agreed on new parities, and they said they were going to intervene in markets to get to cheapen the dollar, but it was a controlled cheapening, and it was, it, was, it was by agreement, it was by consent, and they did it. And then by 1987, the dollar had got weak enough that they said, okay, that's good, let's lock it in. And they met at the Louvre in, uh, in Paris, and they agreed, they set the new parities, and they, they agreed to keep it there. And for almost 20 years, from 1987 to 2010, I guess a little over 20 years, um, that was the great moderation. We didn't have high inflation. We didn't have currency wars. Uh, the price of gold didn't do a lot really until around uh, until after 2000 uh, for other reasons. But you did have great currency stability. And that kind of blew up in 2010 after the global financial crisis. So, the, the by the way, the big brain behind this is Robert Lighthizer. Lighthizer was U.S. trade representative in the first Trump administration. He was deputy U.S. trade representative in the Reagan administration. He was around at the time of the Plaza and Louvre Accords. And what he's saying is, we're not going to trash the dollar or destroy the dollar. He wants to have another sit down with the G7 members. And, you know, in theory, it would include they'd invite China and um, you know, Russia or other large economic powers and, uh, and set new parities and move towards them. And it might involve a slightly cheaper dollar, but it wouldn't be an outright war. It would be moving towards uh, currency stability. Now, here's the here's the twist. Um, you're invited to this meeting, and you can work with the United States to achieve these paris, uh, paris. But if you don't, right? If you don't, if you're if you're using excess capacity and you're dumping and you're trashing your own currency, then we're going to hit you with tariffs. So your choice is going to be join this currency club, with, modeled on the Plaza Accord, or we're going to slam you hard with tariffs, which Lighthizer did to the Japanese. That's how he saved the U.S. auto industry in the, in the 1980s. Japanese were taking over. They put high tariffs on Japanese cars. So, uh, so this is not a currency war. He's trying to end a currency war. He's trying to achieve stability um, and do it cooperatively. But if you don't join the club, you're going to get hit with tariffs. So, so yes, you can see that coming. Say, so who are the winners in that? The winners are people who invest in the United States and workers. Uh, the losers are people who are, you know, betting on China uh, or, um, uh, you know, getting their money out of the United States. The BRICS as they are today, so that includes um, four new members who joined uh, at the uh, summit in South Africa last year. So we're now we're up to the BRICS nine, I guess, um, BRICS plus call it. Uh, they represent um, over 50% of the world population. Uh, if you use purchasing power parity, about 55% of global GDP. Um, two of the three largest nuclear arsenals. Uh, so three of the five largest oil producers. This is not, uh, this is not your, uh, you know, your, your grandfather's a third world. These are not poor, impoverished third world countries. These are uh, pol political superpowers, military superpowers, and economic superpowers. Um, so, so first of all, it's not, it's not a trivial group, number one. Number two, uh, if you're asking, you know, will the Russian ruble be a global reserve currency? No. Will the Chinese yuan be a global reserve currency? No. I could give you a hundred reasons why, but they don't have bond markets. They don't have good rule of law. They don't have repo primary dealers, you know, et cetera. They don't have all the things you need to, uh, in terms of having a securities market to be a global reserve currency. So you can forget about that. But, could they collectively issue a new currency, call it a brick, call it whatever you want, they call it a bank or uh, that um, would that they would all accept in trade between each other, 
uh, and that actually third parties would be welcome to join with a, um, uh, an issuing bank and a clearing mechanism and evaluation mechanism. Yes, that would not be that difficult to do. In fact, they're already working on it. While individual BRICS currencies may not achieve global reserve status, Rickards explores the possibility of a collective currency issued by the BRICS. Such a currency could facilitate trade among member nations and potentially with third parties. The challenge lies in the current limitations of bilateral trade settlements, where countries receiving payments in local currencies often find limited use for them. A collective BRICS currency could overcome this by providing a larger economic area for its use. Rickards also discusses the strategic accumulation of gold by countries like China and Russia. He posits that a new BRICS currency might be linked to gold by weight, enhancing its stability and appeal. This linkage would not mean direct convertibility to gold, but would provide a value anchor. As the dollar's value against gold declines, the BRICS currency would gain strength, offering a compelling alternative for international trade. Why haven't they done it yet? What's the missing ingredient? Well, well here's the missing ingredient. So right now, Russia and India, the two of the BRICS members, they're trading with each other and Russia is shipping you know, oil and natural gas to India. And um, India has, you know, tr doesn't, doesn't want to pay in dollars or has difficulty paying in dollars. They can pay in rupees, which uh, doesn't have to go through SWIFT. Mm -hmm. So, but the question is how many rupees does Russia actually need? Answer is not many. And what can you do with them? The answer is not much. And that matter, for that matter, same is true in China. What are you going to do with all the Chinese you want? Uh, you'll, you'll buy some Chinese stuff, but there are limits on that. So the problem with bilateral uh, local currency settlement is if you're the seller and you get the local currency, what are you going to do with it? And the answer is not very much. And none of those currencies are, are big enough to support reserve currency status. But if you get 10 or 15 or 20 or more countries in the BRICS, now you've basically uh, duplicated the euro, the, the European monetary zone, you, because you can go shopping in 20 different places. So now in this world, Danielle, so I'm Russia, I sell oil to India, they pay me in the BRICS currency, but I don't have to spend it in India. I can go to Brazil and buy aircraft. I can go to China and buy semiconductors. I can go exactly. to Iran and buy drones, et cetera. So the key ingredient is not the, the currency concept, it's the size of the area. And that's what they're working on. And the next BRICS summit yeah. is, in yeah. is in October in Russia because they have a rotating chairmanship. So this year, Russia's the chairman. And Sergey Lavrov, the foreign minister, has been a thought leader in this. Uh, Viola Nabulina, the head of the Central Bank of Russia, is brilliant. So they are moving in this direction. I don't, I can't account for what our, our friend, our Bitcoin friend said, but he apparently doesn't really understand what the BRICS are doing. The geopolitical implications of these developments are jibber. As BRICS nations move towards creating a new currency and jibber their gold reserves, they challenge the dominance of the US dollar and traditional financial systems. This shift could lead to a more multipolar world economy, where power is more evenly distributed among several major jabber. Rickards envisions a future where the US must freedom a more jibber and competitive global financial system. The dominance of the dollar is not jibber. And the emergence of new currency blocks and financial strategies will shape the economic landscape. Understanding these dynamics is crucial for investors, policymakers, and anyone interested in the future of global jibber. China's not going to have a gold-backed currency because they're, um, uh, by the way, the gold, the gold powers, the biggest gold powers in the world, if you take gold as a percentage of GDP, so GDP is your economy, and gold is, I think of it as real money, so take that gold to GDP right. ratio. The two biggest powers in the world are Russia and Switzerland. They have ratios of you know, kind of between nine and 12% gold to GDP. US is pretty weak, uh, about 2%. China is a fraction of 1%. So they don't have anywhere near enough gold. So, but to your point, Daniela, why are they buying gold? Uh, the answer is twofold. Number one, this new BRICS currency may have a gold linkage. Now I'm not saying it's gonna be gold backed. You're not gonna be able to take your BRICS currency march down to the People's Bank of China and say, give me some gold. They're, they're not going to do that. Um, but it will have a, a linkage to gold by weight, by weight. So there's one brick or bank or whatever they call it will be equal to something, an ounce, a kilo, I, I don't know, but some fixed weight, not a dollar amount, but a weight. Now the dollar gold market will continue as it is, but in, in that world, the dollar has to do all the dirty work. There was the dollar is going to be going down against gold if brick is if a brick unit is tied to gold by weight 
and the dollar price is going up, meaning the dollar is going down, what's happening to the brick? It's getting more valuable. So there would be a strong interest in having the gold. But he, but here's why China's buying gold. And it goes back to what we said earlier about seizing and stealing the Russian assets. Because let's say you're the you're a central banker, finance minister of any country that's running a trade surplus. You're making money. What do you do with the money? It's no different than you or I personally. We make money. We have to decide what to do. You pay your bills, but do I put it in a savings account? Do I buy stocks? Do I buy bonds? Buy real estate? Whatever. Countries have to do the same thing with their trade surpluses. So do you want to buy U.S. treasuries in a world where the U.S. is stealing them? Probably not. Do you like uh, Japanese government bonds or uh, uh, you know, German bonds or Italian government bonds any better? I don't think so, because if the U.S. is stealing them, what's, why, would there's any, why would those other countries be any better? So you very quickly get to gold. It may not be your first choice, but it may end up being your only choice once you get away from these government securities.